David, you're on. Greetings. Great. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and children. If there's any there, I don't know if there is. Yes, there are. Uh, and welcome. Welcome. Um, it's a great honor for me to, uh, to chat to you guys. Um, uh, it's been um, such a passion of mine uh, all the time that I spent with Commodore, 12 and a half years in total. And I always felt it was part of my DNA. And um, I, I, I have an immense uh, fortune that I'm able to uh, travel the world and go to meetings where all of the, uh, the retro um, and Commodore and Amiga fans meet. And, and I absolutely love meeting and chatting to everybody. Anyway, as I understand it, what you guys are, are looking for from me today is a, an overview of, of my career at Commodore. Um, and um, then uh, hopefully, uh, if you want, we can open up to questions and so on. Um, essentially, I, uh, how I joined Commodore was a, a complete and absolute fluke. Uh, I, I'd been living in Australia. And in fact, I was working for Pioneer Electronics. Mm -hmm. I was a sales manager. And um, we had a young son then, um, and um, my my wife, my first wife, was uh, getting quite uh, homesick for the UK. So we decided we'd um, go back to the UK. And what we did is we left Australia. We had two weeks holiday in Thailand, and then I put them on a plane back to London. And I spent the next seven weeks traveling the world, looking at what was going to be the next big thing, whatever that may be. I had no idea what it was going to be. And it was during that period that I discovered that uh, computers was obviously a big thing. And I, and I then realized that home computing was, could possibly be a massive market. So when I got back to the UK, I, in those days, of course, there was no internet. It's 1983. And um, in the UK, all the jobs were advertised in the newspapers, Thursdays, and Sunday newspapers are full of the, the good jobs. So I scoured all of the newspapers looking for anything with the word computer in it, bearing in mind that I knew absolutely zero about computing at all. Anyway, there was a job that, as I recall, I think it was about selling computer services. And it was a, a, an agency in London. So when I rang them up and it took all of my selling skills to get an appointment for, for an interview because I've got no, <laughs> I've got no background at all. So anyway, I turn up at this, um, this place and I remember very, very distinctly as I arrived, there was a lady leaving and I remember holding the door open for her as, as British gentlemen do. Anyway, I walked in and the guy said, come on, Mr. President, sat me down and we had the interview. And at the end of the interview, he said, Mr. President, he said, this, I've got no doubt that you could do this job standing on your head, but I'm not going to put you forward for it. And I said, oh, thanks a lot. He said, no, hear me out. He said, you've got the most incredible retail background I've ever seen. And he said, and as a professional recruitment agent, it would be remiss of me not to find you a position that would utilize all your skills. So I, I got up to leave. He said, sit your backside down. He said, did, he said, this is incredible. He said, did you see a lady leaving as you arrived? I said, yeah. He said, well, she's just given me a brief for a, a position. He said, I've not even had the chance to write it up because, you know, we finished our meeting and she left and you've just come straight in. He said, and I think you'd be absolutely perfect for this job. And it was a job with Commodore. I, I didn't go for that job and it was never advertised. Anyway, so two or three days later, I'm sitting across a, a, a table uh, in, a, in Brown's Hotel in London with this girl, Eileen Stroud and um, having an interview with her. And it turns out that um, what they wanted, they wanted somebody to sell uh, their business products, which at that time was pets. They hadn't got, um, there was no uh, you know, PCs or anything. They wanted, they wanted to open a new channel selling into the retail market. And so that's, I was specifically recruited for that. Anyway, um, Three days later, I was in front of Howard Stanworth, who was then the MD in Commodore UK, and I got the job. It was so incredibly unbelievable, but there you go. Anyway, my first day into Commodore, I'll never forget it as long as I live. There was a guy who was in charge of the business systems division. He had just been recruited himself. His name is Mike Tate. And when I walked in, he hadn't got anything for me to do. 
He hadn't planned anything, hadn't done anything whatsoever. And we sat there in, I sat in front of his desk and his secretary came in um, and she said, um, she said, uh, Mike says, I'm just going to go to the supermarket and stock up on coffee and tea. Do you have a preference for what tea you like? And in front of me, he rang his wife and he said, hello, darling, what tea do I like? And I nearly fell on the floor because you, you know, imagine doing that in front of a new employee. Um, anyway, what happened was that um, after sitting down for half an hour, nothing to do, I, I went and I found this guy called John Baxter, who at that time was Commodore's marketing manager. So I introduced myself and I said, John, look, um, have you got anything for me to do? Because, uh, you know, I, I want to get to work. He said, as a matter of fact, David, there is. He said, there is a brand new shop just a big shop opened up on the North Circular Road. He said, I've been meaning to get to go and have a look at it. He said, we've not got around to it. He said, go, go over there, give me the address. He said, um, and come back and give us a report. Fine. So found this place and I walked to the door and the guy on the other side of the door, he said, uh, who are you? And I said, oh, my name's David Pleasance and I'm from Commodore. Oh, Commodore, come in, come in. And he put a glass of champagne in my hand. And I thought, I'm going to love this job. This is amazing. And it turns out it was their open day. And they'd actually invited Commodore, but nobody from Commodore had replied. So it's just a complete fluke that I went in on that day. Anyway, um, I had to determine how I was going to do this job because they didn't have a clue that what they wanted me to do. So I said to Michael, I said, look, what I need to do, because I've not been in the UK for four or five years, I need to check out all the retailers and find out who will be the best partner to go with in, initially. So I went around and in, in, uh, in the UK, you've got yeah, Dixons and Comets and Curry's and all these other different um, chains of stores. But there was one um, smaller chain, a company called Lasky's, and they had uh, 54 shops and in 26 of them they had a store within the store concept called micropoint and they were selling business products they weren't there wasn't computing but they had um you know uh, typewriters and, and business software and stuff like that so i went to their head office and said can i can i get permission from you to go and interview the managers of the micropoint stores because you know we want to launch a new products and i'd like some feedback so i got a written letter from them to tell me uh, to tell them that I was allowed to talk with them. Anyway, I, 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 did, I was in the 24th store. I've been in all those other stores, and I had two left to do after this one. Um, and, of course, in those days, there was no te mobile telephones. So I was in the 24th store, and the phone rang, and it was Eileen Stroud who had recruited me. Um, luckily, I was in where I said I was going to be. And she said, David, do you remember in, in our interview, I told you that things happened quite quickly within Commodore? And I said, yes. She said, well, it's your lucky day. She said, the 64 has gone crazy. It only been launched a few months before. And we need somebody to look after all the, the uh, major accounts and you're it. So I was dragged away. I, I never got to, to, to sell pets anywhere, um, which was an indication, by the way, uh, I very quickly found out that Commodore never ever had a business plan of any kind. I mean, I was recruited to sell a product that they it turned out they never had enough of. They would never have been out of supply, if, even if it sold into them. But anyway, that's how I got into the consumer division. And um, so I started um, selling VIC's, uh, VIC 20s and 64s. And actually, the, my boss then, uh, and that division was a guy called Paul Welsh, and he didn't like me. Um, and the reason he didn't like me was because he didn't recruit me. Um, what happened in Commodore a lot was that, you, you know, you might be, if you needed somebody, you, you might be allowed to recruit from outside, but then there'd be a freeze. And he, if you needed somebody, you had to recruit from inside. And that was what happened. So I was sort of given to him. Anyway, very soon after that, um, we moved to, uh, Commodore built a purpose-built facility in a place called Corby. Um, and we bought a 10 acre site and, and built on it. Uh, it was uh, assembly and warehousing and distribution and admin and marketing and everything all in the one place. Fantastic location really. And um, we had a brand new um, managing director come in because some of the people that 
were in, in Slough, where we were originally, did not want to move somewhere else because they'd got children at school and whatever. So anyway, we had a new MD come in, a guy called Nick Bessie. And he was from, um, he was from IBM actually, he was a marketing guy from IBM, really switched on guy. And one of the first things he did is he said, is to come out with me for the day. And he said, I'll meet you here tomorrow at the office at nine o'clock. I said, no, you won't. If you want to come out with me, you've got to be here at seven o'clock because I've got an appointment with the co-op, which they were a two hour drive away. So we sat in the car and he said to me, um, all right, David, what's going on? And I said, well, do you want me to tell you what you want to hear or shall I tell you the truth? And he said, only ever tell me the truth. What's going on? And I said, well, I've got a big problem. He said, what's that? And I said, it's my boss. And he said, oh, everybody says that. I said, no, hear me out. I said, my problem is that, that my customers hate him. I don't know why, but it's really difficult. It makes my job really difficult because they don't like him. And he said, oh, I think you're exaggerating, aren't you? Anyway, we walked into this meeting in the co-op and the, the marketing guy, uh, marketing director I was meeting, Peter, he came to come down and sign us in. And the first thing he said was, Hello, David. He said, you haven't got that bastard Welsh with you, have you? <laughs> it was his opening words. And Nick Bessie looked at me as to say, you've set this up. You know, you must have set this up. Because I had not, no opportunity. So Nick says to him, um, why did you say that? And Peter said that that poor Welsh is never going to set foot in this building ever again. And so Nick said, why? And he said, well, he said, you guys agreed to take some stock back from us. And we've been waiting for a credit note forever. He said, and Welsh was in here two weeks ago and I was on my way into my board meeting and he positively assured me I'd have the credit note within a couple of days. So he said, I went into my board meeting and told them and he said, he didn't, he didn't show, he's, he's not turned up. It's made me look a fool. He's never set foot in this building again. Anyway, let's now let's carry, I just wanted to set the scene for you because it was turbulent times, if you like. Anyway, um, basically what happened was that I started to um, use my marketing skills and we started putting packs together with the 64, which had software and, uh, and they were very colorful because I've always said that, you know, if you're looking at a computer, it's a piece of plastic with some keys on it or a piece of metal with some keys on it. And it's a very difficult thing to market as such. So I wanted to market it as to this is what it will give you. Um, rather than just sort of trying to explain the technology. And so we did several packs, all different things. For example, one pack we did was we was called the Light Fantastic Pack because we had a light gun game in there, which was, was the first ever to do that. Um, we had another pack called the Connoisseur Collection. And in there, we, uh, we had, I think, the first mouse in a computer ever. We had a product from Japan called Neos Mouse and Cheese, which was an art package. And we did two packs a year and it worked really, really well. Now we ended up keeping the 64 alive for two years longer than it should have been. Absolutely, without any doubt at all. Um, then of course we got the 500. I, I, I had nothing to do with the Amiga 1000 because that was a business product. Um, I think you guys know the story about the 1000. But we got the 500 came in and there, then I was allowed to really, really have free range. So I wanted to do exactly the same thing with the Amigos with the under 64, but in a bigger way. So I sat down with my team and said, look, what's going to be the next piece of a big piece of software? What's going to be big? And they all agreed that it was Batman because Batman, the movie was coming out and ocean software had just been to Hollywood and paid a million dollars to, um, uh, to use the, the, the name uh, Batman, the, the movie f for their game. And anyway, so I went up to um, the guys at Ocean and I said, listen, gentlemen, I'm going to put a proposal to you now that you will either have the balls to go with or you're going to send for men in white coats to drag me away because, you know, you might think it's that crazy. And they said, what do you want to do? I said, I said, I want to put a pack together, but it, it's not the fact that there's an Amiga in there is going to be almost incidental. It's going to be the Batman pack. And I'm going to replicate all your artwork so that we are selling the same product. And I said, and in order for me to do that, um, I want you to give it to me. I said, when's it going to be ready? And they said, September, we think. 
I said, okay, well in September, I want you to give it to me exclusively for two months. Can't buy it on its own, only buy it in the back. They said, okay. And then I said, basically, I want to pay you very little for it. And I only want to commit to 10,000 pieces. So the first thing it said was send for the men in the white coats, because this is a crazy thing. But anyway, they sat and just discussed it. And they said, David, we've got a couple of concerns. I said, what's that? They said, first of all, we believe that our dealers are going to be really angry. They're going to be pissed. And I said, well, I think they will be, but if it goes the way I think it's going to go, they'll only be angry for a couple of days because I think they'll start selling a 400 pound product instead of a 40 pound product. And I think I know what I'd prefer. I said, okay. He said, David, we just paid a million dollars out. We estimated it's going to cost us another million to make the game. And we've done all our numbers and we know how many we've got to sell, not only to get our money back, but obviously to make a profit. And we are afraid that this activity will, will you know, impact on those numbers. And I said, well, look, bear in mind that I've got much more marketing budget than you have, but that marketing budget is going to be given to you, basically. We're, we're working on this together. So, you know, I said, I really think that you, you shouldn't have too much to worry about. Anyway, they, they had the, the balls to go with it, which I always respect immensely. And the net result was exactly as I predicted. The dealers were, were angry for about two days. And then they started to sell, they started to sell the Batman pack really well. They ended up, it did impact their numbers. They sold five times more than their highest estimate that they were going to sell, for which they were obviously you know, greatly you know, blessed and i didn't take ten thousand pieces from them i took 186 thousand pieces because that's how many batman packs we sold in 12 weeks at christmas 186 thousand pieces so that's kind of how uh not long after that i was i was a med uh, sales and marketing director at commodore uk and they were fantastic days. They really, really were great days. I mean, I built a relationship with the, with the games publishers um, that nobody had ever done before. And they were coming to me in droves saying, well, can we have our product in your next pack? Can we have our product in the next pack? And so on. And anyway, my, um, my boss then um, was a guy called Steve Franklin. And um, of course he was, um, you know, relishing in all the glory that um, this plan had worked for him. And we, we got very close, I'll be honest with you, we were quite close and why not? I mean, anyway, um, I thought to myself, well, this is as far as I can go in Commodore UK because, you know, I, I've got a boss who's quite young and, and then the vacancy came up for general manager of Commodore Electronics Limited. You may, you may not know, Commodore Electronics Limited was based in uh, Basel in Switzerland in the canton of Aish. And it was the holding company for the whole group. Everything was based there because they paid zero tax. Now, I applied for that job and got that job. Um, but what the interest for me was that I had 35 countries because I looked after all the countries where we didn't have an operating office. And for me, I'm a real hunter. That's the kind of salesperson I am. So I was given, you know, this opportunity to sell into 35 countries and I absolutely adored it. It was phenomenal. Um, anyway, then one day um, I, I was doing really well there. Uh, I, I signed up India. We got, we got new business in India, which of course Mehdi Ali didn't want because he's a Pakistani and he hated the Indians. Um, but that's another story. Um, there's lots of stories in between, but I'm just kind of getting to the kind of a big overview. Anyway, um, I was at a general manager's meeting um, in Frankfurt. Whenever Mehdi Ali came over, he'd either uh, have a meeting in London or have a meeting in Frankfurt, depending on what food he fancied, I guess. Anyway, I was at the general manager's meeting in Frankfurt and we'd finished the meeting. And um, I was just about to leave and he said, pleasant, sit down. He said, I'm going to give you your wish. And I said, which one is that, Mehdi? I've got lots of wishes. <laughs> He said, no, he said, you've been asking me for ages to you know, let you loose in the US because then, you know, they're not selling very much. And um, he said, I want you there today. 
He said, um, in fact, he said, I want you on the seven o'clock flight out of London, no excuses. And this is where he made a big mistake because it, it didn't occur to him because he, he did it all the time. The seven o'clock flight out of London was Concord. So he, I, he made me fly on Concord one time, which, um, you know, I'm very thankful for. That was amazing. Anyway, uh, he said to me, look, he said, Jim Dion is the, um, uh, the president of Commodore Inc., which is where he said, I want you there as vice president, so consumer products. He said, go and kick ass and get some business going. So the very first day I walked into Westchester, the uh, first thing I did was to go and see the engineers, because I've always believed that without engineers, we haven't got a business. And I was absolutely shocked because we had seven Amiga engineers. This is in uh, January of 92. We had seven Amiga engineers and we had 40, 40 PC engineers. And I, I, I couldn't believe that because in 92, who the hell would design and make your own PCs? They were coming out of the Far East in droves, so cheap. And anyway, I discovered that what had happened was that Medi had just appointed a new head of engineering, a guy called Bill Sidness. And Bill's claim to fame was that he he was responsible for the IBM PC Junior, which is, I think, considered the biggest flop of all time. And we recruited him. And so the reason we had 40 PC engineers there is because he gave 40 jobs to his mates. That's the only reason. I mean, why else in 92 would anybody have PC designers and engineers? It didn't make any sense whatsoever. Anyway, I, when I sat my team down, I've got a good team, three reps and um, four marketing people, sat them down and said, right, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. And they said, um, what do you want to know? I said, well, why aren't you selling anything? And they said, David, we're not allowed to. What do you mean you're not allowed to? We're not allowed to. We're we've been told we can't sell anything to anybody. I said, why? They said, we don't know. So this is crazy. I said, look, let's make some appointments and let's go and visit these. Let's get to the bottom of it. The very first place I went to was um, Sears Tower in, in Chicago. I think we were on the 14th floor from memory. And I had set, set up this meeting and there was about 12 of these director types sat around the boardroom table. And I introduced myself and I said, you know, it's David Pleasance, I've been with Commodore, I think it was about eight, nine years, something. And I said, um, you know, I'm here to try to, you know, generate some business. And, and I said, you know, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. And I'm very, very much a man of my word. And, um, you know, all I want from you is the truth. And I said, will you please tell me why you're not paying your bills? And they said, because we're waiting for you to take all the stock back. Oh, I said, that's interesting. I said, I, I've never known Commodore to be a lending library. You know, we, we don't do that. And at which point they pushed a letter across the, the boardroom table to me. And it was a signed letter, uh, sale or return. And it was signed by Jim Dion, president of Commodore Inc. In writing. And they were stuffed to the gunnels. Guess with what product? Have a guess. Anybody? It was CDTVs. Now, can you imagine Sears selling CDTVs? It's just, I mean, they're hard pushed, you know, ringing a till and putting something in a paper bag, let alone trying to sell something as complicated as a CDTV. Anyway, I had no option. I had to take them back because it's signed by the president of the company. I didn't have any option. Thing is, this is that Mediali didn't know and it turns out that Jim Dion had done this with all the major customers in the US and they were all stuffed with product they couldn't sell, all waiting for it to be returned so that they could start trading again. So I had to think very quickly on my feet. So I said to them, gentlemen, you, sh you should never have been sold this product. I'm really sorry. It's the wrong thing that they've done. And I apologize for that. And I said, obviously, I will honor this agreement that you have. Uh, I said, but to, to be honest with you, um, you should be selling the product that we're selling lots of in, in Europe, and that's the Omega 500. So you could sell that product. And I said, I really don't want to start my career in the US with a big negative on my books. I said, how about um, whatever dollar value your returns are on the CDTVs, 
you give me an order to the same value of Amiga 500s. And if you do that, I will give you your own pack, a Sears exclusive pack. At which point they agreed. And I managed to, you know, at least we started trading again. Now, the interesting thing is that every quarter's end, we'd had a meeting with Mary Alley and discuss what we'd done and what we we're going to do for the following quarter. It just happened that I'd got my two sons over from the UK on holiday. So I wasn't at that meeting. And um, Jim Dion was there and also the, the, the vice president of the business products. I can't think of his name, Jeff, somebody other. He was at that meeting. And um, obviously when he saw all the figures, he went ballistic because my figures were, were, were actually negative. Well, they weren't negative, they, they were flat. And he got on the phone to me, he was ranting and raving. What do you do for this? And, all that? Take the... and I said, what are you asking me for? I said, what do you mean? I said, ask Jim, ask Jim Dion. I said, ask Jim to give you the envelope I gave him to give to you, which he did. And inside was photocopies of every single sale or return agreement that Jim Dion had signed, which had stopped Commodore selling flat, full stop. I'd love to have been a fly on that wall, but I, I, unfortunately I wasn't. Anyway, cut a long story short, I cleared that all up and we started trading. So then I got, got up to Maddie and I, I've been there about 11 months, I think. And I went to Maddie and I said, right, Maddie, my, for the moment, my job here is done. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I can't do any more here. He said, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. I said, look, Mehdi, I said, I've got us all trading and they're doing pretty well. I said, but I do not want to sell them anything else. He said, why? I said, because you and I both know that we've got the 1200 coming out fairly soon. And if I keep selling them 500s, as soon as the 1200 comes out, they're going to say, will you take our 500s back? because you sold it to us, even though there was no sale or return agreement. And he understood that. He, he clearly understood that, that it could be a problem. I said, if they reorder because they're doing well, that's up to them. They can't blame us for that. So I went back to, to Europe, to UK, and I went back to CEL for a, actually operating out of the UK just for a short time. And then I got a... Um, I got a phone call from Medi, and I'll never forget it because I was in Athens and I was I had the biggest hangover of all times, the mother of hangovers. I just signed up a new distributor for Greece and we'd been out on the on the town and I was drinking oozer all night or whatever it was. Anyway, Medi's on the phone saying, no more excuses. I want you back in London. Uh, meet me there t today. So that's when he came in and he said, right, come, we're in big trouble. He said, uh, we need cash flow, we need money, money, money. He said, and you're back in charge here, no matter what you say, I'm not taking no for an answer. And um, he said, you know, bring us the money. Um, so I then said to him, well, look, you know, yes, I can read a balance sheet, but finance is not my my forte. Uh, I said, uh, we had a, a guy, Colin Proudfoot, who was, um, I think he was financial director, I'm not sure. Anyway, I said, I'd like Colin to be co-MD with me. He look after the finance side of things and I'll, I'll bring the money in because that's what I do best. And Colin and I, I didn't have, I never met him before. We made a really, really good team. Um, and as you probably are aware, Commodore UK was the strongest business. Uh, in fact, we were the very, very last. I think it was 14 months after the parent company declared bankruptcy that we ended up having to do the same. Um, because as each of the other subsidiaries very quickly went, then um, we just um, bought their stock and kept kept on trading. Um, so it was it was quite a bittersweet, really. Um, so that's an overview of kind of um, my uh, my progress throughout the company, and why I've got I guess such a broad view because I work you know not just in one place. Um, but there's lots of stories that I think you'd like to hear about that, um, you know, you, you probably don't really understand why. Now, let's talk about, for example, um, the infamous Amiga 600. Now, I'll tell you how that came about. As I mentioned at the beginning, we kept the Commodore 64 going for a good couple of years beyond its real, its true sell by date. But the time came and I knew that was going to be the last Christmas. 
for it. So I went to Mehdi. I said, Mehdi, I've got this customer base, this socioeconomic group who could, who could afford the 64, the 200 pound price point they could afford. I said, that product is no longer, um, it's, it's no longer going to sell. And I said, what I would like is, can we produce a low cost Amiga, which um, they can get by and get into, and then as they can afford it, they can add more bits to it. And I said, we should call it the Amiga 300 so that there's no illusion about where it sits in the model range. And I said, I think we could get away with the 249 pound price point. So that was what was agreed. The next thing you know, is I get, I don't know, it was 20,000 Amiga 600s delivered into my warehouse. And they cost more to make than the 500, get that. Because they called it the 600, it killed all the 500 sales stone dead because everybody assumed that it was being the 600, it was a more upgraded version of the 500, which in a couple of areas it was, but mostly it wasn't. And it meant we killed our, our, our golden goose laying egg with the 500, killed it stone dead, and was selling a product that we were making hardly any money on because they changed the whole concept. And the most sour thing about it all was that all the all the early machines that came into us all had a 300 on the motherboard because that had been designed that whole concept i don't know what you think but i honestly believe that it would have, there was the right thing to do is to produce something to replace the 64 at a price point the market could afford and that's how they screwed it up with the 600 unbelievable really um what else can i tell you about um most of these stories are about the um uh, the misgivings and, and uh, of Mehdi Ali and uh, how, how inept he was at just about everything. I mean, I can't, it's very hard to explain when, you de when you're dealing with somebody who not only doesn't understand anything about the business, has no interest. You know, all the time that I worked for him, he never once came to us and said, look, you guys are doing the business. What do you need? Tell us what the market wants. What product do you want? What price point should we meet? They never asked once. So instead, for example, we get sent all these plus fours. I got sent 10,000 plus fours that nobody had ever asked for and didn't have a place in the market. It was really a bit like the Mega Thousand, but not but nowhere near as, as um, technically advanced. But it, it didn't, it was betwixt and between. It, it wasn't, it wasn't a game machine and the software, the business software, it was, was pathetic. And nobody ever asked for that product. And suddenly you've got to, you've got to try and, and, and sell and turn the product over and make money for the company. But nobody wanted it. As it happens, ultimately, I ended up selling not only all of our plus fours, but the world's inventory I sold. Um, we we had to do that we we put a pack together with 10 cassette games for 99 pounds we lost a fortune but at least we got rid of them you know um what else can i tell you about um oh yeah the, you love this story um because of the, all of the packs that we've done and the relationship that i've built up with the all the software games publishers um the, the guys from Cygnosis, um the two uh, joint directors Jonathan Ellis and Ian Hetherington asked if I could get Matty Alley up to them. They wanted to talk to him. So I literally dragged kicking and screaming Matty Alley up to Liverpool. And when we got there, Ian Hetherington, who was the technical director, he said to Matty, look, Matty, he said, by the way, I'd, I'd already um, put uh, CD32 development kits into all of these places. They were all working on, on games that took advantage of the CD32's superior performance. And of course, the plan was that we were going to launch the CD32 actually in the spring summer of the following year. Uh, that's another story which I'll come back on to. Anyway, Ian said to Mehdi, look, Mehdi, said, I've been looking at the technology that you've got. It's really good. He said, however, if you do this chunk, 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 and you do that little change and this little change, you'll have a much superior system. Now, most people who don't understand technology would have said, 
listen, Ian, you're talking to the wrong person. How about I get my head of engineer, Dave Haney or whoever it is, to contact you and you go through it with him. But he didn't do that. He, he got angry because he thought he was being talked down to. Of course he wasn't, but he was just that ignorant. He got really angry and I ended up dragging him away. Now, not that much later, Cenosis get bought by Sony. And not much after, time after that, Ian Hetherington is head of Sony PlayStation. He was offering us that technology for free because he liked us. And because of Medi Ali's reaction, we turned it down. What do you think of that? <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> Nobody's talking. I can't get, get any reaction from you. I can't. I don't know whether this is going down well. We're in shock. We were muted. Yeah. We're shocked. Am I doing all right? Are you happy with, with what I'm telling you? Oh, yeah. These stories? Good, good. Now, do you know there's. There's, there's another reason why Commodore was destined to bank, bankruptcy, not only because they never had a business plan, but also because they never had any external auditing. So they never knew what was really going on. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll give you a perfectly good example of that. Uh, Commodore Netherlands uh, was um, the, the, the uh, general manager was a guy called Bernard Van Tien, and he's dead now. Anyway, he used to brag at every general manager's meeting, he used to brag to us that every quarter end, when he had not reached his forecast and target, he would invent and write invoices and he would send product out of the building on the last day of the quarter and send it on a five day journey so, and then he'd take it back in again in the uh, beginning of the following quarter. And he did this every quarter without exception. So he's reporting all these sales and one would imagine the, uh, the, the currency to go with it that didn't exist. This went on quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. And so Commodore never really knew its true financial position. How can it? You know, it, it didn't make any sense. And that story I just told you about, about um, uh, the CDTVs being sold, sale or return. See, Commodore assumed all of those products, there was, I'm talking about probably half a million pounds worth of product, or half a million dollars. Um, they assumed that they'd been sold and they'd got the, the money for it, and they, they hadn't. So can you see the dilemma of a, of a company that is not in control of anything? It's not got a business plan. It's got, it hasn't got a product uh, roadmap that you know most companies would have. It never did any market research, uh, and it did, and it never knew how much money they had. So there's a, there's a recipe for disaster. So anybody got any questions? Are you open for questions now, Mark? On the yeah. okay. Can you hear? So uh, David was. Medi Ali, do you think he was evil or was he just just not interested in in keeping the company going? He just wanted to just to torpedo the company and have 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 done with it. I, I don't think he deliberately torpedoed the company. Um, although to be honest with you, if we'd have if we'd have hired a team of professional saboteurs, they couldn't have done a better oh. job. <laughs> oh. um, no, I mean, I think the, the fact of the matter is that he had an ego a mile high, which oh. is not surprising because the way I describe um, Medi Ali, he was like a Pakistani Danny DeVito. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly what he looked like. I mean, he, the cigar he always had was bigger than him. Um, he, had a, he had this massive ego, but he, he, he just had no interest in... in and trying to get to understanding the business. Oh, okay. you, you've, got to, you've got to remember his background, right? Um, basically what happened was that um, after Jack left, um, uh, Irving Gould, of course, um, being a 22% shareholder, um, he, he recruited a number of people. Most of them were pretty useless. <laughs> um, well, they were. I mean, you know, the guy from Coca-Cola is told you know, we're not making any money. 
show as a profit. So what he does is he closes factories down and cuts costs, all of which is just a short-term gain. And I think that yeah, first year, I think we had a, something like a $25,000 profit. But that didn't mean anything because the following year, you know, everything's gone to pot because he's got rid of everything. Anyway, what happened was that um, Commodore needed uh, 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 some additional funds. And so Irving got um, got this company in. I just can't think of their name at the moment. It's Mental Glob. Um, anyway, Medi was the guy that came in for this company. And Medi got them a $50 million loan from the Provident of America. Mm. And, and so on that basis, I think Irving thought, oh, this is a good guy, uh, and put him in charge. Now, what you've got to remember is that they were, they were greedy. Certainly, Medi Ali was greedy. He was, I don't know if you know this, he was earning $2 million a year when uh, at that time the head of IBM was on, I think, 700000 He was earning $2 million a year from Commodore um, and, and certainly not earning it. You know. um, but I, I, think, I think, honestly, the combination of a, a very big ego um, and I suppose he just got away with what he could get away with, you know. But, but the truth of the matter is, it's, trust me, I swear to you, this is the truth. I got on pretty well with Irving and every time I went to, to um, Manhattan to, to their offices, I'd always go and see Irving I, and every time he, when he was over at CBIT or something, I always went to see him. And I used to say to him, Irving, I've got to talk to you about this. This is going on. He said, I don't want to know. Hmm. I said, but you know, I don't want to know. He said, I put the man in charge. He's going to do it. Hmm. And he, he would never listen. He would never let me tell him some of the tra tragic things that are happening. Now, here's another good example of Medi's recruitment. At the same time, remember, remember I told you I, about the 40 PC engineers? At the same time as he hired Bill Sidness, he hired his other guy. I can't remember his name, to be honest with you. And this guy was head of manufacturing. And he said to Medi, right, Medi, he said, we don't want Hong Kong, we don't want Singapore, we'll be already, we, we don't even need Braunschweig. Um, I, I'm going to recommend that we build the CD32s in the Philippines. Now, I thought to myself, I don't understand this. There's something very wrong here in the fact that we were selling nothing into the Far East in, in, in those days, in, you know, in, in the 93, 4, 5 period, we were selling nothing. So I said, why in God's name would you build a factory manufacturing a product which is five weeks by sea from your major market, i.e. Europe. It didn't make any commercial sense whatsoever. And then I find out why he got us in the Philippines. The company he was with before was based in the Philippines and that's where he was. And he had his mistress there. <laughs> so, so there's there's a good example of, of, of Medi's recruiting. You, never you know, it's it didn't make any sense. Uh, let me give you another example. For a long, long time, I kept saying to Medi, "We are you are wasting so much money." You know, every single subsidiary was given their own marketing budget, and it, it was five percent the turnover, or in some cases maybe three or four percent smaller countries. But I said to Medi, "Do you realize how much money you are wasting?" And I said, he said, what are you talking about? I said, we need a global branding. We're a global company. We need global branding. And he still didn't understand. I said, look, Medi, I just went on holiday. And I, I, me and my family, we went, to, we went over to Spain. I said, when we arrived at Heathrow Airport, there's this great big poster, and it says, Sony in a message. I said, when we landed in Malaga, there's exactly the same sign in Spanish, the same message. I said, that's global branding. I said, if you do global branding, you don't give every individual country its own marketing. Mm. You do the marketing for them. And for example, let's say we replicate the, the Batman pack, for example. Now imagine, I'm not going to a company and saying I'm going to buy 10,000 pieces. You're going to them, you're going to say I'm going to buy half a million pieces because I'm going to supply this product right across Europe. 
their target audience is exactly the same as mine kids who need the approval of their parents that's what the marketing that we were going for so you imagine we get the pack design we, we get we, we buy the right software we get the pack design and it's done in multiple languages you then ship over the the artwork and they get it produced and printed in their own country you then do a television commercial and you do you do all the dubbing in different languages you use all this money that you save by doing it in multiples they wouldn't do it mm. so one day one day Mary Ellie brings me up and he says I've been listening to you about this international marketing thing I said oh yeah he said I've just recruited somebody and he's going to uh, head of head of marketing he said that he's got a he's got a business system specialist to work for him and he's got a consumer specialist so just give me any help that you can fine so I never met the, the guy, I think his name was Peter, but the guy who was in charge, of, I never met him, because the first thing he does is that he hires really expensive officers in central London. We, we were in Maidenhead then, and we had reasonably priced offices and we had room. He could have come and worked from there. It would have been much better if you think about it. Anyway, so he hires very, very expensive um, offices. He spent £140,000 having a bespoke office suite of furniture made for himself, wow. which I ended up, I ended up when we all, when we, when Commodore UK eventually had to close, I ended up selling that for, I think, 400 pounds or something like oh. that. <laughs> oh, well, wow. I'll tell you this, but now the, the, the consumer guy, I can't remember, he rang me up and he said, David, he said, I hear you're the guy that knows about the consumer marketing. I said, yeah, we're doing pretty well. He said, can I come and talk to you? I said, with pleasure you know come pick my brains as god is my witness that guy sat across my desk for 14 minutes and he said i've got all i need to know and then disappeared yeah. never never saw them ever again <laughs> but i don't i don't know how much money they all got paid they did absolutely <laughs> sweet fa and this is merely his idea of international marketing <laughs> i mean it's, i mean honestly you, you couldn't you couldn't write a uh, a soap could you that had all this in it you couldn't write it unbelievable really um david in your opinion well here's a theory some people believe me people some people say if the cd32 had sold in more quantities it would have saved commodore from going bankrupt at least for a little bit longer would you agree with that or no absolutely completely no <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly why. Because, um, in my opinion, the plan we we had planned the launch of the CD32 and the le release and everything of it, the best ever for anything we'd ever done in Commodore. It was we'd actually done a roadmap for it, oh. and as I said, I'd got I'd got development kits with all the software publishers that were writing games specifically for it. Oh. And then Medi comes to me. I think it was in August. And he said, um, I want to release the CD32 before Christmas. I said, you are absolutely crazy. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I need the extra revenue. I said, Mehdi, you're not going to get extra revenue. All you're going to do is said, we've got all our 1200s allocated. We've got them sold. They're ready to be all booked in and all the rest of us. So 1200s is going well and, and it's, a, it's a, a, a money spinner. I said, if you launch the CD32, you will kill it just like the bloody 600 killed the 500 and he, he wouldn't listen absolutely refused to listen so we we were then forced into a position where we had to we had to launch it in september and uh i'll give my my team credit we um uh, my marketing manager dawn she she uh, hired us the the uh, science museum which was a fantastic place to launch from it really really was and um, anyway, I, I'm going to tell you about I'll tell you about the launch leading up to the launch, and then I'll come back to why it why it was not successful, why, why we would not have you know um, saved the company. No way. Basically, what happened was that about three weeks before the launch of the CD32, which I'd set for September the 16th, and the reason I picked that date, again part of a marketing ploy, was that all the invitations had. 16 will never be the same again because this was a 32-bit you know um computer that, that we were launching 32-bit games console and anyway about three weeks before the launch 
there is an article in a PC magazine where Tom Kalinsky, who was the worldwide president of Sega, was interviewed by this guy. And this guy said to Tom Kalinsky, so what about 32-bit based games consoles? And Tom said, can't be done. Okay. If anybody could do it, if anybody could do it, it would be us, it would be Sega, it can't be done. <laughs> and it was in print. And I went, thank you, God, thank you, because <laughs> that is the most one, three weeks before we're ready to launch, right? Then to add to that, another bit of luck, about a week after that, a guy rings me up and he says, David, I'm sure you won't remember me. He says, I certainly remember you, he said, but we have done business before. He said, we've got these big poster sites um, all over the country. And he said, you know how we work. Uh, when you book a poster site, you pay 50% up front. And then on the day that you, your campaign starts, you pay the other 50%. He said, I've got three fantastic sites in central London that a guy's already paid half the money on and he's not going to go ahead with it. So he said, I'm offering them to you for half price. Oh, by the way, and one of them is right outside Sega's head office. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so thank you, God. So anyway, somebody, somebody in, um, in our, ag our agency, our, our, our advertising agency, I'm not sure who it was, but I don't know if you, if you ever saw Sega's advertising in, in Europe. It used to be, to be this good takes ages, to be this good, and then they spun ages around to take Sega. Clever, very clever, because it's Sega and ages backwards. So I put a big poster right outside the head office, which said, to be this good will take Sega ages. <laughs> <laughs> because that said so and that went that was incredible i mean we got no internet then but that went all around the world i mean and and actually it, it, there's a picture of it in my book and it's easy to find um but that and it, what was really funny about it because actually in those days it, we were still pretty much a cottage industry oh. and everybody knew everybody i mean i knew nick alexander who was my equivalent at sega he was the md of sega we, we used to, um, you know, be competitors in the day, but we'd have a beer at night, you know, this is how it was. Anyway, shortly after that, just before Christmas, there was, um, we had our annual uh, industry dinner, uh, Indian it was called, where we used to all get together and raise money for charity and all that kind of stuff. And anyway, I'm there, I think I've got three tables with my staff, and Nick's there with his staff, and he walks over to me, it was so funny. He walks right up to me and he said, um, a bit close to home, Mr. Pleasance, a bit close to home. And I just said, well, Nick, where needs must, where needs must. And never another word was said, but they were seething. They were so angry. <laughs> <laughs> but they did it. They said it, you know. I said, there is a God. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, getting back to the CD32, exactly as I predicted, the CD32 killed all the sounds of the 1200, killed the bloody golden goose. And yet, because the product was built in the Philippines, mm -hmm. and we owed, we owed the Philippines government some money for some taxes or something, they wouldn't let release them. So we, we didn't have anywhere near enough CD32s to fulfill demand. But because we, we, we hadn't sold the 1200s, because the CD32 had killed it, can, can you see what I'm saying? That the, the, the completely illogical decision. He thought it was going to be sales on top of the 1200s. And it's no way it would ever have been that way. No way in God's name. Especially when when, when we did release the CD32, the software was crap. The software was just ported from the 1200, which I did really quickly because it was easy to do. They'd got nothing written specifically utilising the, the additional features of, of the CD32. It was an absolute bloody disaster from start to finish. When you tried to buy out the Commodore and Amiga assets after, yes. the, after the Commodore bankruptcy, uh, yes. you failed in, in doing that because ESCOM outbid you. Is that correct? ESCOM? No, no. I got no, it wrong. No, okay. no, not at all. How was that? Uh, right. We were cheated. We were cheated, cheated. cheated out of it. Yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you exactly how it happened. So Colin, as I said before, Colin is an amazing financial guy. Colin Pride, fantastic. Okay. And we sat down, because I, I just said to Colin, look, I, I'm sure that I can do a better bloody job of running this company because um, it's so close, it's in my veins, you know? And, and he agreed. And so we sat down and we devised a business plan. And I can go over the business plan principles with you shortly. 
Anyway, we devised a business plan, which was so good, we raised $50 million. And how we did that, we used a, an accountancy firm called Coopers and Lybrand, who um, were, uh, these were specialists in, in management buyouts. They'd just done a very big one in the UK. It was a, um, a, tra a transport bus company. The managers bought out the whole bus company. It's quite a big one, very successful. Anyway, basically, we, we raised $50 million. And that was made up of, I think there was um, two uh, high wealth individuals. Mm. There was a there was a guy who um, represented, I think, a group of high wealth individuals, and between them, they they raised twenty five million dollars. The other twenty five million dollars was coming from a Chinese manufacturing company called New Star Electronics, oh. who up up until that point in time, New Star had been ripping off and selling Sega and Nintendo products into China and not paying a penny in license fees. But they had been told to get legit by the Chinese government, who at that time were trying to join GATT and all these other things, right? So from our point of view, we had the most perfect business plan because if 50% of the company is owned by the manufacturers who are able to always give you the best price and, and they're in the lowest cost uh, environment, and, and you, you know that, that they've got to maintain a quality because they're a part owner of the business. Mm -hmm. It was the perfect setup. But what happened was that uh, I think it was about 24 or 36 hours before the auction, um, Petro Dechenko, who used to be Mediali's bag carrier, um, that's what he was known as, um, he, he, he joined ESCOM. Uh, he, by the way, he was one of two people in Europe that got sued um, by the liquidators, uh, uh, the Dutch liquidators. But I'll come back on to that. It's another story. But anyway, um, he uh, he stole them from us. He went to them and said, look, don't pay $25 million. We can give it to you for $5 million, whatever you want, you know. So they, they left us, which meant we were left with $25 million. So everybody said to us, well, you can still bid because ESCOM bid 14 and the, the uh, uh, creditors committee forced them up another million dollars. So they've only paid 15 million. Why didn't you buy it? And he said, well, nobody has taken into account except us that we are going to have to cash flow the business because every single supplier to Commodore had just been burnt big time. So do you think they're going to give us credit terms? You've got to be bloody joking. So we knew we had to finance the business and we calculated that if we did everything that we knew we had to do, seven months and two weeks to the day, we should be in a position where we could carry the business on credit terms. We knew we needed $50 million. Now, ESCOM didn't take any of that into account because they bought it and then they spent a load of money buying shops and other stupid things. And needless to say, they went bankrupt. So we would have done exactly the same thing. And, you know, we're two honorable people. We, we, there's no way that we were going to take $25 million of other people's money and lose it because that, that was inevitable. Mm -hmm. Can you see what I'm saying? It's, you know, it's completely ridiculous. So, yeah, we were cheated out of it. So can I, can I tell you about our business plans and so you understand what we were going to do and, and how we were able to raise 50 million bucks? Um, the first thing is that um, take each brand by, by on, its, on its own. First of all, Commodore, the Commodore name and the, and the chicken head logo. What we were going to do is that we were going to license that to anything with a plug on it. <laughs> so all, you got all of, you got all of these companies in China making products, some of them very good. Um, that their name is Honky Konky Shonky. They got absolutely no chance of getting into the European market. So we say, right, you can license the Commodore brand. We want three percent of your wholesale price as royalty. And all it would cost us as a company is a team of uh, uh, quality control people to make sure that whatever was sold with our name on it was up to scratch. That's a royalty coming in on a regular basis with very little investment from Commodore. We were also going to say to those people, oh, by the way, if you would like, we've got our sales force out there selling into the retail market anyway. How about we act as your agents and we sell your product for you into the same shops that we're already going into and we want a 5% commission. 
So what we do is take the order, send it in, they deliver the order, we get 5% commission. That's a fantastic business model that we would have very little um, overheads to run and that would just be, just be generating money, which would then come in to help us to promote the Amiga market. As far as the Amiga brand was concerned, um, the only thing I was going to do with that licensing, it would be um, things like um, clothing. You know, everybody loves the T-shirts and tracksuits and all these sort of thing. License the Amiga name to, to people to providing that and getting a royalty from it. The other good licensing one would have been the brand name CBM, because at one time that was as powerful as IBM. So you could, you could license that to somebody making PCs so they could bring out a higher brand of product under the CBM license. Now, what we're going to do with Amiga? Well, there comes a time when you know that you are going to run out of um, steam with, with new models, so on and so forth. And so we came up with this concept that um, we, we worked with a company in Germany called Micronic. Um, and we got, with, with our help, we got them to design a, a mini tower and it was designed that it could carry uh, and fit any motherboard from any of the, of, of the Amiga models. And the idea was that our independent dealers, not the, not the multiples who can't, as I said, can't even cash up and put something in a bag, but our independent dealers who, who it was their life business to, to understand technology as they did, they would, uh, somebody could go into them with the 500 and say, I want to upgrade to a 1200. So they'd take the motherboard out and they'd put a, a, um, use all the privileges that they could from each model would be used with the tower case. This whole concept was called Amiga Infinity. Yes. And in, in order to support that, we were going to sell PCBs on their own because you can. I mean, we could have kept the, that Amiga line going for quite some time by allowing people to upgrade in that manner. And anything new that we did invent in the Amiga line would be made to be able to fit into that case. Do you understand the concept? Yes. Good. Okay, now as it happened, of course, when we, when we didn't, uh, we weren't even able to bid, Micronic went ahead and, and, and released something, they call it Infinitive with a V on the end, because they couldn't use our, our name. Uh, but as I understand it, the first products they made, they made them quite cheaply, and I think they were made out of mostly out of plastic, and and they weren't they weren't considered to be very good quality. But ev eventually, I think they went on and made metal cases, and I think they did quite well with it. Not sure. Now the other thing is that of course Commodore was working on on a whole new project, which the code name was Ombre. Now Ombre, I'll just basically tell you what Ombre is or was it was a uh, an hp risk based core to which they added a 3d rendering engine a blitter a chunky planar it had 5.1 surround sound stereo which was state of the art at that time and i can tell you dr ed hepler who's the guy who designed it he showed he showed it to me demonstrated it cobbled together with software as to what it could do and i'm telling you guys I've not seen anything like it since. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And, and so that would have been our new range, but it was not backwards compatible and never would be because you can't hold back advanced technology by trying to, you know, let something um, be compatible with it. So that was, that was what we were going to do is would, would be the ombre. Um, and then the, another thing that I wanted to do, and bearing in mind that you have a background working with the, with the um, Hi-Fi people for Pioneer and stuff, I was going to sell the CD32 to all the Hi-Fi companies for them to add into their stacking system. So that all they'd have to do is to redesign the front loader instead of the top loading thing that we had. Um, and then they could use because if you think about it, there's been nothing new in, in Hi-Fi stacking systems really since Blu-ray. Nothing. So I, I, I believe I could have sold it into Toshiba and Hitachi and all these people. And then they would be manufacturing it in such large volumes, it would bring the price right down to allow us to be able to, you know, do a lot with it because, it, you know, obviously the cost to us would be a lot lower. Uh, and I still think that's a, that's, a, that's a good idea that could still be done today, to be honest with you. Um, 
so that was the, that's the kind of the basis of our business plan uh, and you know to be honest with you I, I really think it was a winner i really really do i don't know what you guys think of that but i think you can now understand why we had we got the support and we got the money uh, advanced ready to be advanced to us and we were cheated out of by mr petro bloody chichenko <laughs> Uh, now, um, I, I should, let me tell you, again, I was saying uh, about there was no control over, over the, uh, there's no auditing done. Uh, Colin and I, we had to go and see um, the Dutch liquidator, uh, simply because there was something that, I can't remember what it was, I think it was an IP that Commodore UK and Commodore Holland shared. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something very insignificant, but we had to come to an agreement with the Dutch liquidator about it. So Colin and I went over to meet this guy, nice guy. And while we're talking to him, he, um, he saw by the way, he says, what do you think of this? And he pushed a piece of paper across to us and we're looking at it. And it's an expense report from Bernard Van Tienen. And it was for an establishment called Yab Yum which apparently was the most high profile brothel in, in all of Holland. <laughs> and this, and this was to, for the value of $250,000. <laughs> so, so you can see what I'm saying about, you know, th there being no auditing and no control over the finances. It's no wonder that Commodore went under. It's absolutely ridiculous, you know? Um, and, and also in line with that, I just told you that Petro got um, got sued um, by the Dutch lawyers for, for incompetence, I think is probably the only way to describe it. So did Bernard Van Tienen. They both got um, sued, but their asses were saved because three days before Commodore Board announced their, the, the bankruptcy, they had a meeting with their insurers and they took out a policy with their insurance company, non-cancellable, non-revocable, non-any bloody thing, right? Uh, to protect uh, officers and directors of the company from being prosecuted. And they spent $5 million on that policy. And that $5 million was ours. That was credit as money that they spent. And, and they, that saved Tichenko, because all of his expenses, which were huge, were paid for by this insurance policy, and so was Bernard Van Tienen's. And that really irks me to think that it was our money that got spent in, in protecting those assholes, you know, oh. really. Um, any other questions, guys? Yeah, oh, I have a question. Um, you mentioned ESCOM, and uh, I've heard that name a couple of times before, but I've also heard another name called Tulip. Where do they fit into all this? So I said that again, where do, where do ESCOM fit in? I've heard the name ESCOM before, but I've also right. heard the name called Tulip. Where do they fit into all this? Right, okay. Yeah, uh, Tulip was a, a, a bit after, actually in my new book, um, there is, uh, we tell you all about everything that happened after ESCOM. Well, from the day ESCOM um, won the auction, we tell you that story and, and it, it sh tells you how the IPs and the, and the, the patents and the, and the logos were all being bandied around. Everybody was trying to get a piece of the action. Some people just wanted to make a quick buck, what people we call the vultures. Some people had pretty good intentions, people like Gateway. And, and actually, when you find out, I was amazed when we started our research, I was actually amazed at some of the technology that they were using the Amiga 4. If any of it had come off, would have given a whole new opportunity, world of opportunity for the Amiga, but not as a home computer, but as, as other things that they were developing. Uh, Tulip was one of the companies who bought um, some of the technology. Uh, and, and again, they, they, they opened a new division and then it just all went sour. Um, but if you, if you, I think there's a copy of my book there, the new book. The book is called From Vultures to Vampires. And the reason it's called that is, as I said, in the beginning, it was all these vultures. If somebody was developing a new product um, and they were using, say, the Commodore logo, they'd get a, a cease and desist letter from somebody saying, we own that copyright, you can't do that. And the same thing with Amiga and so on and so forth. Um, but... The, the story that we tell goes from 
the days of ESCOM right up to today, when you've got a product like the Vampire, if anybody's ever seen the Vampire standalone, which is an amazing product, um, that's why the book is called From Vultures to Vampires. And on the back of the book, if you, I think you've, you've got a copy there, um, if you look, there's, a, there's a, a, a white round panel and all of the companies that are inside and named in the book are on, the, on that back panel. So you can see all of the companies who are involved. That book, volume one, goes from 94 through to, two, uh, sorry, 95 through to 2004. Um, volume two, which we're still working on, will bring us up to date. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very good read because honestly, if, if you love the Amiga as we all do, when you see the things that were being developed by certain people, what they wanted to do with it and how it went wrong or whatever, it's a very fascinating story. And it's really, it's, 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 it's showing how the, our community will not let the Amiga die. That's really what it's all about. Excellent. Any other questions, guys? Thank you, David, for your, your talk. We have a question. Matt has a question. Matt has a question. The uh, the product the CD twelve hundred the CD ROM add on for the twelve hundred yes when, yes when did that come about whose idea was it like when when did that when uh, did the story do you know anything about the story behind that. Yeah, actually, in my first book, The uh, Comment on the Inside Story, there's a whole chapter by Beth Richard. She was the engineer that designed, was designing the CD1200. And her whole chapter is interesting because it, it tells about all of the things that they worked on uh, that they were developing and how few got actually got released. But of course, it was bankruptcy can't really finalize that product uh, and we actually we have a um, we have a prototype i say we um there's a, 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 a metro computer museum in leicester which is oh. about for me it's a bar on the train they've got they've got a um uh, a, a prototype of the cd1200 there but it just didn't get finished because we've had the company went bust before they got it finished and it, it uses the Akiko chip. Okay, so it plugged into the bus, bottom of the 1200? Sidecar. Uh, I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, when it comes to technicalities, I'm not your man. I, 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 I you know. Well, you know, let, well let, let me tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll own up to you. This is the true factor. I did a back of the envelope calculation one day of how many computers I sold, not, not my team, how many I personally sold. And it's, I estimate it's about 2.2 million. Wow. And the truth of the matter is, I never switched one on. <laughs> <laughs> how about that? Uh, I hear you that see, somebody, somebody is trying to uh, build a replica of the CD1200. Yeah, there's, there's, there's guys in Australia that are. Okay. Um, I mean, people communicate with me from all over the world and there's a lot of things happening. Um, but all I can say to you is this, is that um, I am I'm desperately trying to find a way that I've got, I've got two missions. One is I want to I want to unite all of the different groups, Commodore community and Amiga communities around the world. I want to unite them. And I've got an idea how we can do that. But I, I want to get back into the Commodore Amiga um, world um, because I, I, I've got some ideas, things that we can do that will, I guess, continue the, the uh, I guess, add more episodes to this long and never ending story. Uh, I want to get back into it in a way that, because I, I think you can tell I've got the passion. Uh, it's never left me. You know, I, when I worked for 12 and a half years at Commodore, through all of the trials and tribulations, I loved it. I could not wait to get to work every day. It was my DNA. Mm. And, and I really, really miss, I want to get back into that again. And I'm going to look for ways of doing it. So if I end up doing some kind of a Kickstarter, looking to raise funds for things, please support it. Because I, I am the man for the job. <laughs> as long as I can... <laughs> As long as I can stay alive, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a young man anymore, but uh, 
so far, apart from being diabetic, I'm pretty healthy. And um, I was in Prague last weekend at a, a thing called Bite, Bite Fest as a guest speaker there. And um, I, I know I've, I've gotten, I've been triple jabbed and I've, I've had a, a, <laughs> lateral, a lateral flow test when I got back and I'm, I'm, I'm negative. So <laughs> I'm keeping my way out of, away from, from COVID. <laughs> Oh, but there's another thing, by the way, guys. If you go onto my website, which is uh, uh, davidpleasance.com, www.davidpleasance.com, there's a da there's a free download, which is a music CD uh -huh. that I recorded in '95. It's free download, and it's got it's got 14 tracks of music. It's it's not computer music. <laughs> it's real live. It's live music, live instruments, live vocals, and actually, I I you know in my former days i was a professional flamenco guitarist and i actually i've done a recording on that album which was a tribute to to jay minor it's called para mi amiga which means for my girlfriend and um so if you get free download and it's got some really interesting music on there i think you'll like it and it's free so you know please please have a look download it and i hope you enjoy it any i think most people have heard it are pretty happy with it <laughs> <laughs> very good we'll give it a shot Questions, guys? Thank you, David, very much thank for your you. very nice talk. Thank you, very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've enjoyed it. And um, anyway, I'll be in the States uh, later this month, and hopefully we'll catch up sometime. That's, that's certainly part of my plans. Thank you very much. Take thank care, you. please. Thank you. I will certainly try. I'm, I'm now going to drink a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.